Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo, and welcome to a new series on housing options. When I decided to do this housing options series, I had in my own mind an idea of what the options would actually be. But of course, once you start really looking at something properly, more often than not, you are surprised at what you find. And this week's guest is no exception. I'm talking to Eliza Factor, who among other things is an author, but here we're talking about her Lonely Worm Farm project, which Eliza has created for her son Felix in mind, but also with a much bigger vision in mind. I'm always genuinely humble when people share their stories with me, and I appreciate the trust that they place in me. I always get a lot from these conversations. It's not just the ideas, it's that connection. And that really was how I felt in my conversation with Eliza. I often feel that the only people who understand my journey are other parents with children with additional needs. And of course, we aren't all on that same road, if you like, but we've been on a similar journey. And we all have a common destination in wanting our children to live the life they want and to be happy. So as much as this episode is about creating a long-term home for Felix, it's also about sharing a story, the good parts and the difficult parts. So you can listen for some great ideas, but you can also listen to remember that we're not alone. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to be reminded of that. If you want to find out more about Eliza's journey, then you can visit her website, elizafactor.net, where you'll also find links to her book, Strange Beauty, her memoir of growing up with Felix, and all the links are in the show notes. But enough from me, let's hear from Eliza. Welcome, Eliza. Can you just tell me a little bit about your own background and a little bit about, obviously, your son and also about the Lonely Worm Farm Project? I'd love to. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you for having me here. I'm a, a writer, and I met my husband, Jason, in 1999, and we had our first child, Felix, in 2002. He was a 9-11 baby, actually. I was very committed to writing and art, and I wasn't really sure I wanted to have a baby because they take a lot of time. But Jason was right by the World Trade Center when the planes came, and I didn't know if he was going to come back. And I was just like, okay, I need a little, if he comes back, we're having a baby, I need a little piece of Jason with me forever. And so Felix was born. I had the chicken pox when I was pregnant with him. And so most likely what happened is the varicella virus affected him. He has kind of global brain damage that associated with the varicella virus. And what that means in today's way of defining people is that he has autism and cerebral palsy. So he totally radically changed both Jason and my life. Neither of us had grown up with people with major disabilities. And I was a writer, so I was just so immersed in language and Felix didn't develop language. In the beginning, it was awful because we couldn't figure out what was going on and we were afraid he might die. And we were, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, what his diagnosis was. But once we figured out it was probably just the chicken pox and he was going to be with us, then he was such a cute and intriguing, kind of charismatic child. He ended up just totally revolutionizing my understanding of communication and language. And I used to just love watching him, just the way he'd look at a doorknob. Like it was a whole universe that I was just kind of using to open and close the door. And all of a sudden, this door and this doorknob became like these puzzles, like these cosmic, beautiful puzzles. He was a great child. And I was like, I felt really happy with him and my husband when we were at home alone. And then whenever we'd leave the house, everything became much more complicated the way that people would look at us and just the way even the way friends and family would talk with us was kind of hard and so I had two other daughters who are neurotypical and wonderful and when they were born I realized that usually when you have a kid and they're not disabled that transforms you into a it's like a opening into a new culture like everybody's kind of hugging you you're like you're just like all of a sudden like you have something in common with it seems like the whole world everyone's like oh how you know like you're embraced into this community that I hadn't been embraced in at all when I had Felix. And so I got inspired by this wonderful preschool my daughters were going to that had all these great community events. And I was like, why don't we have like picnics and family movie nights for young parents who have young kids with disabilities? It doesn't have to be about therapy or anything. It's just a way to get together and support each other, just like these other parents do. 
So I started this organization called Extreme Kids and Crew, which is now like 10 years old. And it was this idea of bringing families together with kids with any kind of disability through the arts, play and conversation. It was so great. It was just so great to meet all these other families and, and, and meet all these other kids that really didn't fit in. And they weren't like Felix, like that feeling of being outside and different and loving your kids, including their weirdness, having that so awkward, like that just goes away when you're with other people to get it. And so it just ended up being this incredibly energizing experience. And the organization Extreme Kids grew beyond me really quickly. Like I started it and I worked it for two years and, and then I found an amazing executive director and I was active in it, but it wasn't, you know, it was really truly a community endeavor. But it, it showed me how that loneliness and, um, you know, and despair, you know, that you can get when you don't feel understood and you're afraid your child isn't understood can really be leavened by just being in the same room with other people making art or like having a picnic or just laughing at something or crying you know just being with people to get it so I started this but and Felix likes I can tell that Felix likes extreme kids and crew because of the way because of his body language but it wasn't really enough for him to be able to take care of him like he needed more help than his school in New York could give him and that we could give him at home so he moved to this wonderful residential school when he was 10 and a half and he can stay there until he's 21 and then when he's 21 the options you know become as everyone <laughs> listening to you knows there aren't so many options for 21 years so I've been thinking about that cliff as they put it for a long time and it was really good I mean, it was Felix's experience at the residential school was so, so good on so many levels because first of all, it showed me that he could really thrive. Like he really thrived. Like he was doing much better there than he had done it. And I realized that like I had been able to create a community for myself and for other kids, but most of the kids that came to Extreme Kids didn't have the level of disability that he did. They could run around and play. Like he's in a wheelchair and he doesn't play like other kids at all. He usually connects with other adults. But at this school where there were other kids with really major complex disabilities, he was just kind of totally normal. He liked that. He had a roommate for a while that they liked the same music. You know, it was just, it was so cool. And you, you know, his body, he just, he looked proud of himself again. Like he had, he had that pride when he was a little kid, but that had kind of gone away when he started, when he was like five and kind of got caught up in the school system. So I was like, okay, I know that I need Felix to be in a community of people that where he's not like the only person with a disability or like a major disability. I learned that from the school. I also learned from the school that even though he can't use words like regular people, doesn't use signs, doesn't use communication devices very consistently. You know, I had been really frightened because of that, that like, you know, if something bad happened, he wouldn't be able to say what it and I realized when he was at this community school that his residential school, that he can advocate for himself. He can make great relationships with people without me being there. And if he doesn't like something, he makes it very, very clear. He creates a riot, basically. And so I realized that a lot of the stuff I'd been frightened of, I thought only I could find a good aid for him, or only I understood what this sideways glance was. I just realized that wasn't true. Like he is really much more, there are more people in the world that are open to people like Felix than I had understood. And he learns. He learns how to connect with new people. I mean, that's, that's what we do as human beings. You get into a new you know, environment and you figure it out. And he's capable of that. So, you know, this school was just taught me these things and it was great. And so when I've been thinking about life at 21, I was like trying to figure out how to take these things and integrate them into a vision for his future. Uh, so I also did some research on the Camp Hill communities, which I really love. So like they gave me a good model to kind of work off. And if, if Felix hadn't had, doesn't, hadn't had the level of physical disability, I would so love just to have him in a Camp Hill community. That would be ideal. And, you know, if anybody doesn't know about Camp Hill communities, check them out. They're beautiful. But Felix's needs are so much that there aren't any, you know, really, it wouldn't really work with the existing ones. But when I was visiting these communities, all of the people there are so positive and have seen such amazing things. And they're all like, you can just start your own. You can do it. We've started ours. And, you know, because if you start something like that around somebody with all these needs, then the structure just kind of naturally, organically will accommodate them. And then more people can come in as time goes by. 
I don't know about starting a big residential community because in the United States, that just means so much bureaucracy and bureaucracy is not my friend. But I thought maybe we can start like a family farm where Felix could live with lots of help. I mean, not us, like I'd organize like, like, you know, farmer and apprentices that stay there for a year and learn about ecological farming and disability at the same time. So like six adults there and Felix, he'll have enough help and everyone kind of enjoy helping him instead of it being too difficult. And then for the community aspect, we can have a day program. So basically just kind of taking the Camp Hill structure, like have people working in like a morning shift and an afternoon shift and a, and a communal lunch and they just have come in and work on the farm in the summer and in the winter do like weaving and candle making, you know, just all these traditional crafts and then you can sell your goods, which gives people opportunity to run a little store, which is fun. And then you, you're also making connections with the local community. So it's like a nice way of including people with disabilities, without disabilities, just bringing people together. So that was my vision. And we bought some land in 2020 and we've just kind of started doing this. We have a wonderful little 29 acre plot of land about two hours north of New York City. We have chickens. We have herb gardens. We've had like a bunch of community raising events already, just bringing people onto the land to help sow seeds and raise a yurt and projects like that. We're building a house for Felix and a farmer. So the idea is to have a farmer living on the, well, we already have a farmer living on this land, but farmer living in this house in 2024 and Felix moving into this house with like a caretaking staff. And by the time he moves in, I think we'll have a pretty regular day program. So he'll be, he'll be moving into a world where people are coming Monday through Friday to farm and take care of the goats and and just do all, do all, do all, do what you do on a farm and like art. So is the aim that other young people, when they age out of the education system, could also live there? Or is this predominantly a community built around Felix? We wouldn't be able to have more than like one or two roommates for Felix for spending the night. But they can, yeah, my hope is that we'll get people from just around the area who have adults with disabilities in their lives and they'll come in. One of my dreams really from the very beginning, which we could never really do at Extreme Kids because of space, you know, in New York City, there's not very much space for things. So we ended up attracting like young kids primarily with autism and ADHD, which was great. But I really love the idea of trying to connect people with all different kinds of disabilities. So it's not just like, I mean, we all have this. I have a place where everyone's kind of coming together to see these this common, you know, these commonalities we share in different forms. So my hope is that the people that are attracted to this farm experiment have really different life experiences, will come from different places, will have different relationships with their body and mind, and we will have people with intellectual disabilities and people with physical disabilities and people that are 70 and people that are 30 and people that are 13. You know, like it's like it should just be the land and the idea attracts them. I'm We'll just see where it goes <laughs> based on who comes. So it's all the funding that you've had to, obviously you bought the land, but are you now fundraising to do all the extra I'll be fundraising for the rest of my life because of Felix. <laughs> but you know what? I was interested. I, like I was an artist and I, you know, like, I was interested in filmmaking. I'm like, I mean, you're always fundraising for one thing or another. It's like you don't just one of those things you can't escape. The fundraising will be for the programs because we need to pay people to teachers and we need to pay our farmers and stuff. And I don't want to charge people money to take part in the programs because no one has any money uh, who's dealing with disability. I mean, part of the thing that I believe, I believe disability can be used as a thing to bring people together. So it's just really important that it's like anything you do in that field is accessible, not just physically, but socially, like, you know, economically. It'll also be a working farm, though, from what you say. Yeah, it will make a tiny bit of money that way. But unfortunately, farms in America make little small farms or they're like writing novels. Like it's like maybe you make 15 cents an hour. That said, we can do all kinds of really fascinating things because we have we have a beautiful place. We can be like making great food together and eating together and that's free. And we can we can also make art and we can do auctions. And like I know how to raise money from all my experience at Extreme Kids. So I'm sure we can figure something out. Long term, then you wouldn't live there. Felix would live there. 
Long term, we'll have we, it would be like our family hub for all of our celebrations and vacations and Christmas and all that sort of thing. But Felix would live there. A farm family will live there, and kind of a rotating cast of apprentices, basically like young people who are doing their taking some time off, figure out who they are, stuff like that. And I must say, I was just looking for a farmer right now. The most amazing people came to me. Like they, so, it was hard to choose because people were so excited about this. So there really are are lots of people that that's their dream do you think that's partly because of what we've been through the last couple of years as well yes i'm sure it's i mean it's made a lot of people reassess what they're doing with their life a connection with other like a, a authentic connection with other people and a connection with the nature i mean those are just such healing things is felix a big fan of nature Yes, absolutely. As long as he can be outside, like he doesn't watch TV or anything like that. So it's like inside gets uh, a little stuffy and there's just not much happening. It's kind of even even if you're in a beautiful interior compared to being outside, like all of that sensory input, all of that colors and the smells and the animals and the wind. There's so much there that he can connect with. So long term then, you obviously create this community. And then I said to you before about the fact we all worry about when we're not around. How would that work after you guys aren't there? You're creating a community, you're creating a structure. So, you know, there's going to be the, whoever's the farmer will be basically in charge of the structure of care around Felix. And there, but there will also be, you know, the other day programs that should continue. I mean, like there would be a program manager and, you know, these are like people that are jobs. So if we successfully create this organization, there will be a fundraiser, there would be a program manager, there'd be a farmer. It doesn't really matter which individuals are taking. I mean, it does matter, of course, but like you can hire new people. Organizations always change and funding streams change and you can never be sure of anything. But I do feel like strong communities, once they start, they take care of each other. So really, that's what I'm doing. I'm just going to get a strong community together. And I have found that disability is an amazing way to bring people together. Just cuts to the bone. Like it's people care for each other. They've learned how to care. And people like parents and kids with disability have learned how to completely to cultivate their sense of humor. They've learned that they can't do everything alone. They're great people. Bring them together. They become strong and powerful and creative. And, you know, like it's just like you build up each other when you're together. You also said there about the fact you bring other people in from outside who don't have a disability. So when you were talking, it struck me, it was a bit like a, an education community. Yeah. Like one of the industries I hope we can develop is to have like a little um, medicinal herbal business, partly because I love herbs, but also because I love the idea of people with, I mean, I feel that Felix is a healing person. Like he, so many people who have worked with him over his life have, and it's, he's not easy to work with. I mean, I mean, everyone used to ask me, how do you get people to work with him? And I'd be like, they come to me, they, you know, they come, they, they're attracted to Felix. And also like nobody who's like lazy would ever apply like you're not making more money you're not you know like you're working so much harder but you also you can get so much from him he will change your life these people know this on some level he has this potential to be a healer and i think lots of people with disabilities have that potential and they are often seen instead only as like patients they're medicalized and so i want to create a place where the people with disabilities are the healers they're raising these herbs they're selling tinctures and teas people from the outside can come and the experience of visiting will be healing but they can also take with them a little bit of homemade medicine so yeah that's one of my integration things i would hope that the experience will help break down some of the fear and pity that surrounds disability thanks for listening one thing my conversation with Eliza reminded me is that sometimes we not only need to accept differences, but we need to embrace difference so that we can see past what we're told, not only about our children, but about ourselves as well. If you found value in this episode, then please do share it with others. And if you would like to focus in on one of the topics the podcast covers, purpose, daily living, relationships and financial security, then visit expandingworlds.com and check out the focus packs where episodes are divided into each of these areas. Of course, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch, Deborah at expandingworlds.com or you can message me online. Just connect with me at Deborah Caldo.